Turn in your Bibles, if you can, to John chapter 14 and um, verse 16. We've been talking all summer about the person of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I want to, I want to, uh, something you'll find uh, fun in this, a real quick side journey, is uh, of late, the last 10 years or so, uh, there's been quite a few people that refer to the Holy Spirit as Holy Spirit. Todd White was a, a pro, he's a predominant minister, and he was the first kind of on a mass scale to, to, you know, just refer to Holy Spirit, took the V off of it. Well, it never bothered me, but it was just awkward after you know, all my life of, of you know, reading the scriptures, the Holy Spirit. Well, we know he's a person, not an it, not a, not a wind, not a power, not a breath. No, him, God, the spirit of the living God. Amen. And he was there in the beginning when the father said, let there be light. He sent forth the word and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep and caused it to take place. He is the power of God, ins inseparable in the same manner that the father is love. First John says God is love. Well, you could say Holy Spirit is power. And so, you know, listening to Todd White quite a bit and then others, you know, different, different groups around the country, uh, really kind of that caught on to take the the off of calling him the Holy Spirit and just refer to him as Holy Spirit for he's a person. I wouldn't say the Peppy, even though it was his birthday yesterday, right? I just say Pastor Peppy, right? I wouldn't say the Billy because Billy, his birthday's today. And so that's just both of them, just proof that they're older than me. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Billy's nine days older than I am. I like to give him $100 and tell him just double it and give it back. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and, uh, and so uh, I, I've been kind of wrestling with that in my mind. I thought, you know, I never feel disrespectful when I pray and talk to him and I reference and say the Holy Spirit, but I also don't feel awkward leaving the the off. And so uh, this is just side journey. This ain't the message today. I hope this will help somebody. But I notice here in John chapter 14, our key text for today, he says, Jesus said, and I will pray thee, Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. And so uh, when Jesus said, I'll pray to the Father, or he doesn't actually say to the Father. Here are the, the straight translations. I'll just pray the Father. You know, when we see Jesus actually praying the Father, what did he say? Our Father, who art in heaven. He didn't say the Father. He just said Father, our Father. And so uh, my point today is on that is just very simple. I want to just set you free and bring freedom to your heart. Amen. If you want to call him Holy Spirit and leave the thee off, go for it. If, it, if you're in the habit like I am of, of saying the Holy Spirit, well, don't feel condemned by all them super spiritual people who just came into light. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, I'll pray thee, Father. And then he talked to him. He said, Father, glory to God. I think when you meet somebody, you get a revelation of who they are. Amen. And we want to just keep meeting Holy Spirit in such a way that we get more and more of a revelation of who he is, that he becomes so real to us that all that he is, we now set our expectation upon him to move mightily in our life. And so to not know of him will lower our expectation. But the more we know of him, he's going to show us more about Jesus and more about the Father. Make all things uh, known to us. Share with us all the truth of God, even the deep things. And so this morning, I want to again focus on him. And in this context of John 14, 16, Jesus said, I'll pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. This word is the Greek word paraclete, and it's translated multiple words concerning him to describe who Holy Spirit is. But he is our strengthener, our intercessor, our advocate, our standby. He is the comforter. And I love this, this translation uh, uh, of the word. It is appropriate. He's the helper Christian. And what that means is he backs us up. Authority on this earth has been given unto man. Uh, God made man in his likeness and image, told us to go and have dominion over the works of his hands and uh, told us to multiply and replenish the earth. And so everything that God's going to do upon the earth, he's going to do through us, Sam. That's called grace. And when we step out to do the work of God and step out to trust God, we have a helper. Who is our helper? God. The Holy Spirit, who lives on the inside of us, who helps us in our weaknesses, 
helps us in our struggles or helps us when we reach the end of our strength, His strength has not ran out. Recently, in te on teaching on kindness, uh, a friend of mine, well, Todd Bailey, Amy's uh, cousin Todd, sent me a great quote. You may have heard it before. It blessed me. Kindness is lending somebody your strength without reminding them of their weakness. That really blessed me because it's frustrating when somebody helps you, but they're going to remind you about it, right? I don't want to be like that. You want to lend somebody your strength without reminding them of their weakness. This is true help. And so when somebody has a need and somebody else comes along to supply strength to that, or I like to just say it this way, Jagger, they're just tugging on the rope in the same direction. Amen. Did you pull out a victory Friday night? Good job. Way to go. Amen. <laughs> we got to celebrate. Even though there's sorrow in the night, joy comes in the morning. Amen. After you get a tough loss, you got to go win one. Glory to God. Go undefeated the rest of the year. Amen. Good, good. And uh, it's helpful when somebody comes to pull on the rope in the same direction. Uh, to, what's it do? It takes some of the burden off of you. Well, I want you to know something. The number one rope puller lives on the inside of you. He's there to take away the pain, take away the burden from you. He's there to supply the help that you have need of. Now, because of his indwelling presence, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20 says, Don't you know your temples of the Holy Spirit? He lives and dwells on the inside of you. Uh, you've been bought with a price. What was that price? The blood of Jesus. Amen. Your life is no longer your own. Now, He has taken possession of your life. He's living within you. That means if you'll situate yourself into places where people need help, you'll find out that He manifests Himself strong. Jesus has a heart to help people. Period. Everywhere He encountered people with trouble... He helped. When he encountered the lepers, he cleansed them. When he encountered the blind, he opened their eyes. When he encountered a demoniac who had so many devils that they chained him up in a cave outside of town, uh, Jesus showed up and uh, took authority over those devils, cast them into the swine, and the man was set free. When he met Mary Magdalene, who was troubled by seven demons, he cast them out, and she became one of his closest friends and confidants. What did she need? She just needed help. When he encountered somebody who's lame in their feet and couldn't walk, he offered them help. When he encountered a multitude that needed food, he offered help. He never looked or backed down from a situation and said, I'm not able. Amen. And he never once that we can find in the scripture said that I'm not willing. The closest thing we have is when the lady came to him who wasn't a Jew and he said, it's not good to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, yes, master, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Glory to God. And her faith moved the hand of God, even though she wasn't uh, in, the, in the kingdom of Israel. Come on. Faith always moves the hand of God. And we don't ever find Jesus unwilling to get in the middle of somebody else's problem. Here's why. If you're going to be uh, able to offer help to somebody, or if you're going to help somebody, two things have to occur in your heart quickly. Number one, you have to decide, am I willing? And secondly, am I able? And if you find yourself unable to help, you'll quickly withdraw from the situation. Somebody says, I need $10,000. Well, you immediately go, well, you know, I got like 10, but I don't have 10,000. You find yourself unable and you back away from that situation, right? Or there's times when somebody needs $10, you actually are able, but your heart's not willing because of another, right? You're either judging them unworthy of receiving the help or for some reason, you, you want to separate yourself from that situation instead of getting in the middle of it. And so for help to arrive, simply two things. Am I able to help? Am I willing to help? And what we find with the heart of God is, if we are willing, He will supply the ability. And you'll never know whether you're able if you're not willing to at least just show up. Was David able to kill Goliath? No. But he was willing. Thus making him able. Should I just quit preaching and just let you have like two minutes just to season on that one right there? Like, isn't it just true? 
Because now what? Because now I'm not operating in my own ability. One of my favorite passages in the scriptures, uh, just three chapters prior to that, in 1 John 14, where Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go to the garrison of the uncircumcised Philistines, for it may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Now, there's 600 people in that army hiding from the army of the Philistines. They're giants, son of Anak. And they're in the high ground. They have the military advantage. And so the army of Israel is hiding. You can't hide in, in faith. There's no faith hiding. If you're hiding, you're in fear. And they were in fear. And Jonathan, the king's son, even though 600 man army would not approach the Philistines, he said, why don't just you and I go approach them? Because if God's on our side, nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Meaning if God's on our side, we don't need the other 600 guys. Just me, you and God's enough. Let's go take them out. And I love 1 Samuel chapter 14 verse 7. It speaks to my heart every time I think about it because the servant said to Jonathan, go, do all that's in your heart, for I am with you. The Holy Spirit said to me that the armor bearer, his servant, his voice spoke just as loudly to Jonathan as the voice of God. He echoed the voice of God in Jonathan's heart. He didn't try to talk him out of the vision God had given him. He didn't try to discourage him. He is facing Sure death to go take on an entire army of giants all by himself if God wasn't going to show up. But he trusted that Jonathan had tapped into a revelation of who God is. Enough to say, go, do all that's in your heart, I'm with you. Yes. And it takes the if out of that. You know, in, the, in marriages today, there's a, a you know, new slang coming in, new phrasing trying to come into the, wet, mar the wedding vows. Uh, as long as this love shall last. I thought, well, we're only shooting about 50% with till death do us part. If we start with as long as this love shall last. <laughs> what's that like? Second argument? Like what? First vacation, you know? <laughs> What happens there? Well, no relationship is fun if there's a big if in it. Right. I'll be your friend if. If you do what I want, if you go where I go, if you let me drive, you know what I mean? Like, if. I was thinking about being 16, sorry. There's a lot going on up here. It's not just what comes out. There's like three more things always going on. The, the biggest struggle is focusing in on just one of the things. I call it ADB, Attention Deficit Blessing. It entertains me greatly. It was always a struggle to my older brother, but it really entertained me a lot. takes the if out of the, out of the relationship. That's a beautiful relationship when you remove the if. It strengthens the leader on the team and it strengthens everybody else on the team when they know what? I'm with you. Amen. I'm not with you if. Go. Come on. Think about the power of that. Go. Do all that's in your heart for I'm with you. What did he just tell Jonathan? I'm here to help. There's something powerful about when a group of people make a decision. I'm here to help. Uh, it's who we are. If we don't stray away as a people from other people's problems. Other people are in depression. We don't stray away and say, I'm so sorry, you know, keep your distance. Don't go around them. They're going to make you sad too. No, we want to get right over in the middle of it. You know, the Lord set me free from depression in 2008. And uh, it, ch it changed my life, saved my life, first of all, and then changed my life. And so now I wake up happy, I go to bed happy, I don't struggle with mental torment, I don't struggle with thoughts of suicide, I don't struggle with, with anxiety, <clears throat> ever. And so I love to meet people that are in that fight so that I can begin to share with them my story and how God helped me. Because if you've never faced that, it's as real as a broken arm. 
that people in the middle of that would do anything to turn their brain off, but they don't know how. And that anxiety is going 100 miles an hour to the point that it causes physical fatigue. And they'll find themselves in the bed most of the time or a desire to be there. And the thought will come and the devil will oblige uh, uh, readily and often that you can turn your mind off, just take your own life and then you won't have to deal with the pain of that. And that's exactly what, what happens to people who, who are tormented like that. Well, when you've been totally set free from that, I get thrilled to come in contact with somebody else who's dealing with the problem. Why? Because the helper helped me. And I'm able to introduce them to him. And I'm able even to share with them, here's exactly what he told me to do. Won't you just try this and just we'll start with this and see if that helps you. And then to see the light come on and to see the sorrow turn to joy. You know how fun it is to wake up happy and go to bed happy and not have any anxiety, any mental torment, no fear, no confusion. Not, I'm telling you, it's wonderful. It's the exact opposite of how so many are living. And especially now in the pandemic, uh, you know, this, this uh, whatever this is that we're living in right now, this Twilight Zone episode that is on repeat. <laughs> Come on, the enemy would love to uh, just oblige uh, every, uh, everybody who uh, is struggling in the mental arena. Wow, it's fun to get down in other people's troubles. Jesus was the master at it. Yes. He's willing. Yes. Turn over to Luke 18. Luke 18. Hmm. Just say this by faith with me. Just trust me on this. Say it out loud. I'm helpful. You really are. It, by the Spirit of God on the inside, you're called to help. When you find someone who needs a hand, you're willing and able to, to lend yours. It's the pattern by which we live. And it, it plows the ground of the heart quickly. When, when you offer a hand to help, it demonstrates the character that's in you. When you're thoughtful enough to give a little of your time and a little of your energy to somebody so that their life might be bettered by it. It plows the ground of the heart. It'll create a relationship, or if it's a current relationship, it strengthens it. Um, the opposite of that, to be selfish and to be centered around yourself constantly, to not offer help, will cause damage to any relationship. Why? Because it looks as if that you're not interested in that other person. And so when we yield ourselves in a thoughtful manner to allow the Lord to use us, he'll put you in all kinds of situations that you know. I mean, you don't plan them. They just show up. Helpful situations just come knocking on your door. I teased on Facebook this week about I picked up a gentleman. Uh, Amy was gone to Ashland. To, her sister had a baby, baby Maverick. And uh, so Amy went to take care of a uh, little two-year-old baby June and help the family out. And, and that's exactly what she was to Jenny and Jonathan. She was just a help. So while she was there, you know, she ate all their food, trashed their house. She uh, lost two of the three dogs they had. No, that wouldn't have been help, would it? What would she do? She helped. Well, Amy don't have, we don't have dogs in the house because she got like 98% of Grandma Thelma's genetic makeup and Mamma Thelma, she didn't have dogs in the house. You know, those were for outside the house. And so now Amy's, you know, she's living for a few days with three dogs. And you know what those dogs will do. After you feed them, then they get rid of, you don't own it, you just rent it. It leaves, you know what I mean? And so... <clears throat> And so they're peeing and pooping all over the place, you know. And so that means my wife. So she called me and, you know, she's telling me how great things are going, how great June's doing. And with a smile, she said, oh, and I got to clean up doggy pee and it was running everywhere. And I got to clean up doggy poo. And I, just words create mental images, you know. And so I got just this wonderful blessing on the inside of me knowing what? There she is doing something that's contrary to her natural nature, right? Now, why would she be willing to do that for somebody else when she wouldn't do it for herself? Because she has a heart to help. Amen. That's what a heart to help will help you do. So while Amy's away, she, <clears throat> she gets on to me because I like to help uh, anybody I see walking on the side of the road, you know. And again, I can't tell everybody to do that, but I do it where I come from. That's appropriate. I think it's inappropriate for dogs to ride inside the car while people have to walk. And so... <laughs> 
Just saying, you know, might be a little degradation of society there. We might want to examine ourselves just a little bit. And so it was beginning to rain. It was the day of today, and it was beginning to rain. I saw a gentleman uh, walking in the rain. I thought I could, I couldn't not help. And so I'm not afraid of uh, of anything. So I'm not afraid of or you know danger or something. I did pick up a guy one time that was so high he wasn't sure if he wanted to be in the car, and um, it was interesting because I wasn't sure that he wasn't going to jump out at any moment. So I kept asking him, "Are you okay, buddy?" And he just kept nodding. <coughs> And then he said, right here is fine. And I thought, you know what? Right here is fine. We did really well. So you can hop out right now is a good time, you know. And then I picked up a lady right over here one day. She's out on the four lane. I picked her up and I, I rolled the window down because she's on the four lane. And I said, would you like a ride? And she said, yes. So I said, great, get in. So I opened the door, you know, and she got in and I said, uh, you want me to take you home? She said, yes. I said, uh, do you live over here this direction? She said, yes. And I said, how far? She said, yes. <laughs> and I thought, oh my, this is getting fun. So my first 12, 13 questions, she said, yes. So I called Amy FaceTime. Thank God for technology, you know. I put Amy on FaceTime, and, and the family was with her in the car. And I said, hey, I picked up a, a new friend, met a new friend here, and I just wanted you to meet her and know where I'm at. <laughs> In case, you know, anything would happen, you know. And <clears throat> I said, would you like to introduce yourself to my family? She said, yes. And so it's really, <clears throat> it'll be great. So Amy said, I think we have some friends downtown that could probably help you with knowing where she is from and where she lives. And I thought, thank you. What Amy did, she offered me help. Amen. When I was running, I did take her through the McDonald's drive through And the only thing besides the word yes, she said was when I got up there, I said, would you like a, a I can get you a Happy Meal or I get you, you know, something. Would you like a yes? And then when I got up to the drive through she said, can you add bacon? <laughs> That's awesome. It's $2 to add bacon. I never knew that. And so you can add bacon to anything. I did not know that. I thought that would make Jim Gaffigan so proud. Jim Gaffigan says, bacon is the candy of meats, you know? It was a moment. I just wished he was, I felt he was with me in spirit right there in the car. <clears throat> but it's fun just to help people, you know? And so, uh, and, and so those friends I had downtown, they did know where she lived, and they did help me out. And so this week, though, I picked up this gentleman. It was really funny. And, and so he needed to get back to Covington. And it's pretty fun when you pick up a homeless guy, and 10 minutes into the car ride, he said, buddy, can I ask you a question? Do you live in this car? <laughs> I felt that he was slightly jealous, you know, because he was thinking this would be a nice place to live. And so I had leather seats. It's comfortable. You know, I had uh, two of my backpacks. I had my duffel bag and everything he asked me for. I'd reach in the back seat and pull it out for him. And so I, I had all my tools. I said, no, I don't I don't live in the car. It feels like it. I, I just work out of this car. And so uh, when I pull up at school to drop the kids off, I can't pull up in the main lane where all the teachers and staff and faculty see, I have to pull into the alternative lane where like uh, the people that are going to long-term park is because I'm afraid when they open the door, multiple things might fall out. <laughs> might have a drill gun fall out, a, a sander fall out, you know. And so, and not because uh, it hasn't happened, because it has happened multiple times. <clears throat> But he needed to get back to Covington, and I searched my heart. Lake was home alone. It was about 5 p.m., and I thought if I take him to Covington, I can have him. I can be back by 9. Lake will be fine. He's probably taking a nap after school anyway. And, you know, my first reaction wasn't, oh, no, this guy, you know. My first reaction was, can I do it, Right? And I was thankful uh, after the situation uh, got resolved. I was just thankful for the development and the work and the help of the Holy Spirit who, who's fas fashioning our character. See, if you don't get into situations where people need you and they need help from God, uh, the grace, there's no need. Come on, the grace to kill Goliath was on that battlefield. And so I've never found myself in a situation where I can truly say I'm unable to help for the helper lives on the inside. So if I don't have it, I know somebody who does. Right. And so if we stray away from every problem because we don't think that we're able.
And I felt good in my spirit. Uh, this gentleman actually said, would you be able to wait till tomorrow? If you can wait till tomorrow, I can get you home. And he said, yeah, I've got a friend in Harrisburg. So I took him to his friend in Harrisburg's house, picked him up the next day. And uh, we, in our discussion, he said, I wouldn't mind to take the bus. I thought, well, praise God, $37, got him a bus ticket, took him, put him on the bus, got him home, fed him, amen. He, he, you know, uh, it wasn't too much. And I didn't do that. Y'all did. Amen. Thank God for your generosity. Good things are happening. Amen. And Mark Hanger said, if you can change somebody's life for $100, you better do it every time. Right? And so uh, it opens the door. What's it do when you help somebody? It plows the soil of their heart to receive the goodness of God. Hallelujah. And so we don't have to stray away. Say it out loud. I'm willing. I'm willing. Say it louder. I'm able. I'm able. It's true. The, the one, the greater one lives on the inside of us. And uh, uh, when, when your natural resources run out, his are only beginning to kick in. Look at Luke 18. Did you get there yet? Glory to God. Verse 35. Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat at the road begging, and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, and he cried out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now this was important why he said, thou son of David, for it was prophesied that a branch and a seed of David would come with righteousness. He would come as one in right standing with God. Malachi even said he'd come with healing in his wings. If he said, if this is the one, if this is the one who's the son of David, then I know he's the one who can help me. So he said, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 39, then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. Hey, keep quiet. Don't bother him. Be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Jesus asked him, how can I help you? What can I do for you? It's a powerful phrase. It, it, it is the doorway into the supernatural many times. What can I, what can I, how can I help? When people are in the middle of a struggle, it, I found it just very effective to bring peace to the storm and just stop and say, hold on a second, how can we help? What's that do? It just let them know, you mean you're willing to help. Yeah, I'm willing to help. How can I help? If you can let me know how I can help, it's very possible that I can jump right here in the middle of this situation. You mean you'd be willing to get in the ditch with me? I think I would. Tell me how I can help. We don't see Jesus uh, backing away from the trouble. We don't see one time where he said, well, you know, if it was just one demon, I could take care of it. But this guy's got multiple addictions. You know, this person is dealing with a really difficult past. If we could maybe just clean them up a little bit before. No. It did not seem to matter at all what the severity of the issue was. He knew what he had was greater than what was against them. And you have to know what you have is greater than what is against you or what is against anybody. The greater one lives on the inside of me. The second thing I love about this is all the people begin to give glory to God. This is the appropriate response. Turn back one chapter. Luke 17. We'll pick up here in verse uh, 11. It said, As it happened that he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and then he entered a certain village. There met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. Now why did they stand afar off? They had to. Commanded by law. They were literally quarantined. Now we used to read this passage in a different light, didn't we? Now we kind of understand it a little better. If they came near by law, they could be stoned to death. And so they stood afar off, and verse 13 says, They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Well, that was a great step of faith. If they go into town, uh, they can be stoned to death. 
But by obedience to his word, they went. As soon as they went, they were cleansed. Glory to God. Look at verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Don't ever let the devil talk you out of being able to receive whatever it is you have need of. If you've got the ability to give thanks to him, you've got enough faith to move the hand of God. If faith can heal leprosy in this situation, and all the man did was fell on his face and gave glory to God, if your voice can say, thank you, Jesus, then the hand of God is able to move your situation. It's not too dire. It's not been going on too long. There's nothing too difficult for God. Come on. Ain't no mountain too high. Ain't no valley low. Come on, baby. The hand of God is able to move on your behalf. What is the appropriate response to help? Thank you for the help. What's Jesus' role in the trouble? He wants to show up if we'll just let him. And when he does show up, all he's looking for is for us to give glory to him and thank him. I'm so glad. We couldn't have done it without. Doesn't it feel so good when somebody tells you that? I don't know what we'd have done without you. I helped a friend of mine pour concrete the other day. And uh, hot sun, 90 degrees, blazing. I, I, pre, I preloaded with water because I'm 44 and smart. They were young and dumb. They were suffering. And I was enjoying watching it. <laughs> And, uh, and so hot sun out there for hours. We're talking about a full, you know, ha- half a day pouring concrete. And um, when we got done with that, not one word of thanks. And not one dollar. And not one thank you. All I really wanted to hear was, if you hadn't shown up, I don't know what we would have done. Right? So next time they got to pour concrete, I'm going to tell them, you know, you might want to drink a lot of water before you do that. I'm sorry. I think I'm tied up at the moment. Right? Because what's their appropriate response to help? Thank you. Man, when somebody says thank you, you're already itching for another adventure, right? <clears throat> But with the, without it, I'm telling you, there's something so supernatural about a spirit of thanksgiving. It moves the hand of God. It enters us into his courts with praise, right? It opens those gates into the very presence of God. That when man recognizes his own insufficiency, that is not a character flaw. It is actually the very thing Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, they shall inherit the kingdom of God. It's the first step into allowing God to move mightily on your behalf. And I'm telling you, there is help from heaven that's waiting for you. And because that if his willingness to help, he has created us with the same character that we were created to go and do likewise. <clears throat> people want to help. In leading this church, leading any organization, if people aren't involved, if people aren't helping, there's a few situations that it could be. First of all, they may not understand the vision or have bought into the vision of what you're trying to do. Hosea says, write the vision, make it plain that others may read it and run thereby. He said there, the vision itself will begin to speak. It will not tarry. It will come to pass. So if you can make the vision of what you're doing clear enough and paint the picture of what it is that you're accomplishing and the direction that the organization's going, it allows people to buy into it and that vision itself will begin to speak to them. They will begin to see, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a help to that. I remember when when Pat took me to Cuba, I came back and began to plan a a, a second trip and take people with me. And I began to tell them and paint the picture of what I encountered the first time and what they would encounter if they went back. Here's why we're going. Here's what we're going to do. And one by one, I began to get buy-in from all kinds of friends from all over the country that said, I want to go. Because they wanted to be a part of that. They weren't going because they liked me. They were going because the vision was clear. 
So if you're leading a team or you're leading an organization or on your job, you know, there's other people that you're working with. Oh, man, when the vision gets muddied, it really frustrates the whole team. Why, the, then the vision quits speaking. And now it all is all about, you know, who likes who and the politics of the man. It's just yucky, isn't it? Man, when the vision's clear, everyone's running in the same direction. Everybody can get involved. And so uh, uh, Jesus made his vision clear. He said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You're witnesses of these things. Go and tell what has happened to you. Mark's account of the Great Commission. He said, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Lay hands on people and they'll begin to speak with new tongues. Cast out devils. Help people. Find the broken. Help them. Find the poor. Help them. The vision is clear. And because the vision is so clear, here we are 2,000 years later, and I'm running with the exact same vision the Apostle Peter was running with. I'm running with the exact same vision the Apostle Paul is running with. We're all running with the exact same vision of the same resurrection of the same Lord who lives inside of each one of us because the vision is clear. It speaks to us. Amen. Glory to God. You know, the difference in, in a, a church, you know, if the vision for kids' church is uh, we need help, that's not the vision. We need help. So nobody will do it. Somebody needs to watch these kids while we're in here in the service. There's no vision to that. You think, do I want to miss the service and babysit them crying, whining, snotting kids? You know, if that's your vision, if that's what you, no, man, you're like, Pastor, I hear this all the time, Pastor, I'll do anything but kids. <laughs> I'm glad Jesus didn't say, I'll save everybody but you. You know, so. <laughs> but when you encounter somebody with a vision for kids and they begin to talk about the effectiveness of what actually takes place back there. What the impartation of the Word of God means to them. See, my mom was one of those kids, right? She didn't come from a, a, a godly home. Uh, her father never attended church and wouldn't even allow them. Eight years old, he finally let my mom take her and her brothers and sisters to church. But it was at church where she met a heavenly father who loved her. That she gave her life to Jesus, learned to pray, learned to talk to God, learned to get answers to her prayer. And it was there that the character of God began to form and fashion in her life. The impartation she received in church as an 8, 9, 10 year old was what set the course and the destiny for our entire family. Our ability to preach. People ask me all the time. They say, how do I learn those scriptures like you? I think, well, you're going to have to rewind and go back because I'm not quoting stuff I learned yesterday. I'm quoting stuff I learned when I was seven. Why? Because somebody loved me enough to impart into me the wisdom of God when I was young. We're not babysitting back there. Are you kidding me? We're filling them full of the life of God and the love of God. And occasionally a troubled situation shows up where we've got kids that are not in a healthy place in their soul because their family is disrupted, because they're in and out and pulled and torn and sometimes people show up whose mothers or fathers are on drugs and so they're living with grandparents and great grandparents and the kids don't know how to behave and we don't treat them like you poor, you know, wretch, get away. Are you kidding? We open our arms up. It takes more help. Somebody has to volunteer extra just to take care of the one so that the regular can take care of the rest. You can't teach an unhealthy soul. You have to heal it. Yeah. Glory to God. What's taking place back there? Life transformations taking place back there. It's something we all want to be a part of in one degree or another. Amen? It's not, well, I, I don't want to baby. We're not babysitting. No, there's life change. Those are future engineers and pastors and teachers and doctors and nurses and community leaders that we're raising up to know God from an early age. Amen. Amy and I, when we were in Bible college, we volunteered for the four-year-old and the five-year-old department. And it was a large church, 9,000 members, 4,000 attendants every Sunday morning. And, and so it was a, a large, even on our Sunday night that we volunteered, uh, there, we, our class had 30 kids in there. I mean, it was a circus. And um, we volunteered because they said, we have need of you. And so that spoke to my heart. 
Mark Hankins asked me to go on a, a missions trip with him in 2010, and um, I, I didn't really have the resources to go. In December of 2009, he said, um, would, you, would you be able to go with me um, to the Philippines next month and to Myanmar, Burma? And I, I said, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. I would really like that. And he said, well, Trina is not able to go, and I need you. My response changed instantly. I said, I'll go. Because he said, I need you, that changed everything. If you just ask me if I want to go, if it's convenient, it's different from you need me. Right? So one of the reasons why people aren't, the second reason why people aren't involved on a team is they don't know that you have need of them. When Jesus needed the donkey for his ride into Jerusalem there, the triumphant entry, he, he uh, said, go find a man with a pitcher and he'll have a donkey tied up beside his house. Let him know that I am in need of it. Yeah. Tell him the master needs it. That phraseology is powerful. If it comes from the heart, right? Words are just containers of the heart. When somebody says to you, I, I need your help, what that does on the inside of a believer it says, all right, let's go. What is it? If you tell me you just, you know, you'd like, you'd like for me to, that's a little different. Now, don't use that against me, you bunch of manipulators, I tell you what. <laughs> we got Pastor nailed now. We can get him every time. I need you, Pastor. No. When somebody says they have need of you, because now you can evaluate and measure, do I have the ability to, to supply what it is that they need? Amen? As a leader of an organization or a team, many of you guys are leading companies, leading teams in different areas. Come on, let the people know, hey, I have need of this. I have need of you. I, Willie George is like one of my favorite stories along these lines. He was working under his uncle, who's the pastor, and uh, he was associate pastor on staff. And in a staff meeting, he said to the staff, hey, we really need uh, to amplify our kids department. And uh, there were all kinds of people, he said, on the team that had way more skill than he did, but none of them presented themselves willing. And just because there was really no one else that stepped up to do it, he said to his uncle, I don't know how well I can do it, but I'm willing to take that on if you need me to. Well, you may not know who Willie George is, but we sure do because we were raised on all of his curriculum and raised on all of his teaching. And over a half a million children have given their life to Jesus because of watching Gospel Bill watching those Willie George videos. We still use those videos. Shanna wore the VHSs out. I had to buy VCRs on eBay. And uh, once she wore out all the tapes, I had to go find the same videos on DVD. Because we've been using those for 20 years. Why? Because he, was he so capable? Was he trained? No, he was willing. And in his willingness, the ability showed up. Glory to God. Number three, the reason that sometimes people aren't involved in an organization or they're not offering help is because they don't know where they fit on the team or they don't know where they fit in the vision. So it's, it's one aspect of what you're able to do with the people around you is to identify their strengths and point them out to them. Uh, people will move towards the complement of their strengths. I don't mean manipulate people. I'm saying honestly, when you recognize as a parent a strength in your children, be sure to identify that, especially you fathers. The mothers tend to do it more naturally. But fathers, your voice in your children's life is the, the, the most important, encouraging voice to the directions and the choices that they're going to make. So when you recognize a strength and you begin to point that out, it becomes formed in their, in their spirit and in their mind, I'm able to do that. Amen. Glory to God. And so I continue to speak over my kids. You are amazing at laundry. You are amazing at washing dishes. You are the best house cleaners in the history of the world. You cut the grass so beautifully. It's working. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now we want to identify strengths. Amen. We want to help people know where they fit. And the fourth reason people don't get involved on a team or in an organization is because uh, they just don't know how to sign up. 
They don't know how to get started. And I, I'm so frustrated right now with all these rewards programs. Every store, every gas station got a separate rewards program. And then you go to, you know, you go to get on there and you're like, are you a rewards member? Oh, I don't know. I don't carry around 64 cards. <laughs> and then you put your phone number in. And then if it goes, you're like, yes. Like you feel like you have accomplished something for the day. I am a member. Full-fledged and recognized. I got five cents off a gallon. And then if you put your phone number in, you push enter, and it says phone number not recognized, you feel defeated. You want to rip the gas pump off on purpose. Why? They've made it difficult to participate. It really doesn't matter how great the vision is if it's difficult to participate. Right? So you go into the counter and the lady says, are you a rewards member? I always say the same thing. I hope so. Because if not, these 22 people will stand in line behind me are going to be here a minute while I sign up. Because if you're offering a discount, I am in. Right? So we don't want to make it difficult. People just want to know, where do I go? Who do I see? What time do I need to be there? What do I wear? Right? If we can make it plain and make it clear of what is going to go on. Billy revolutionized our Saturday work days. I had no clue what I was doing when I started pastoring. They'd show up and when I saw whoever came, I'd decide what we were going to do. I'm like, well, we got this many. We can do this. And then I'd send two or three guys to Lowe's and we'd start at nine. And then we wouldn't get work until like 11 because the material wasn't here. And Pastor Billy said to me, humbly, wasn't being mean or cruel. He just said, Pastor Jay, I think we could do this more efficiently. If we would predetermine what we're going to do, and I'll go and get all the supplies in advance that when whoever shows up, we'll begin to start work. And I thought, you are a genius, Billy Gross. Amen. So efficient at it, we just turned it all over to him, and he is in charge. I got myself out of the way. I was slowing down the team. And uh, it works beautifully, right? And, and so it's a better mode of operation. That Now, anybody who shows up, We've got something for you to do. The last work day I wasn't even able to be at because I was out of town. And they did like five projects. Why? Because we had supplies ready and people showed up willing. Say it out loud. I'm helpful. I'm helpful. 